Start the box? Uh, yeah. Um, this is intended to be kind of an uh, informal affair. This is a birds of a feather session. So, uh, so if you're here to if you're here to hear about the new Flash file system, sorry, there's one cough. Uh, actually, I don't think there's a bot on a file system, but I could be wrong. Um, but so the, my idea for this is just to have an open discussion. I have some slides here, uh, but anybody else who, who wants to stand up and talk about some of their tips and tricks, uh, I've been gathering some of this stuff on the uh, eLinux website. Um, and I've got some kind of discussion topic areas, but we could really kind of just let this uh, roam in any direction we want. And I may take time out to scribble down some notes here. Uh, it's not being, oh, it is being recorded. <laughs> so maybe I won't have to be so fastidious about my notes. Um, so the basic idea, I just tested this, it's not working. Uh, basic agenda is we're just going to discuss any methods and tools well, that I use in Embedded. Uh, I'll tell you kind of how I develop Linux, what kind of tools I'm using. Um, and so just a couple of, basically what I've found is that in hallway conversations with people, you always, you always hear about something they're doing, and you go, oh man, I didn't realize that was, there was like a tool for that, or, you know, there's like, I don't know if you realize how many obscure git commands there are, but there's a lot of obscure git commands. Um, and uh, anyone can stand up and, and present their tips, so it should be an open discussion. This is kind of the general outline of stuff. So I thought we'd go through some Git tips, uh, talk about patch management. What is what is our time on this anyway? Does it say what, what our ending time is? When we're done. When we get bored. I thought it was a stroke of genius to have uh, to have you guys get all liquored up before you came in here. <laughs> so that should make the conversation flow a lot more smoothly. Um, anyway, so we'll go over patch management, source searching, seeing kernel debugging, testing, board handling, personal productivity, uh, any any other ideas you guys have. And again, I don't want to stray into too much kind of technical, you know, how do you write a driver type stuff. There's and anything where there's lots of resources on the internet already. I don't think we need to cover that too much. But it's basically, you know, there's just so much. Uh, out on the internet about uh, developing Linux. Sometimes you miss some of the hidden gems. I can remember uh, talks like this I've gone to. So I'm going to start, I'll go right off the bat with git tips, finding information about commits. And uh, there's a command called git describe. So who's ever heard of this command before? Oh, okay, everybody. Okay, well, never mind. <laughs> okay, so I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the three people who have never, never heard of this before. Git describe is great. And in particular, git describe dash dash contains shows you the actual, uh, essentially the tag that it follows the commit. So you can find out what version of the kernel had a particular thing. So I tend to do these, uh, uh, is that any better? A little bit better. Um, I don't know, so I tend to do these uh, status of embedded Linux. I'm constantly looking to see, well, when did that feature get in? Uh, it also is a testament to how uh, I'm not on mainline, right? So I'm not, uh, I, sh I should be a little bit more aware of what's going on. So another so thing. Vote, vote for this one. This one is new for me. So. Oh, vote. Oh, yes. get described. Okay, all right. No, the contains. So. Oh, the dash contains. Yeah, that's a good one. It's a good option. So also, another thing, I, I was using Git for a couple of years, and I didn't realize, this sounds really stupid, but I didn't realize you could actually put a directory or a file name after it and get the log for just that item. <laughs> That is like super handy. <laughs> okay, so I won't even ask or show of hands on that one. <laughs> uh, so, but it allows you to narrow the scope of the log. Uh, and then git show, I hope everybody knows what git show does. Um, but uh, aliases, okay, so you can actually put aliases. Yeah. Tips about git show, but Okay, just a sec, let me get my pen. <laughs> Oh, commit ID file name? Oh, will it only show you the changes for that file name? No, it will show you the file. Oh, it'll show you the file. For that, as it was in that commit. Oh, okay. So it gives you like a, a snap, that snapshot. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm write that down. <laughs> so it's the commit ID. <laughs> Okay, 
Can you pass the plea and on get show? Or on the... Okay. Yeah, okay. So that was interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so get alias. I stumbled across this one. I use it kind of a lot. Uh, so you can make anything you want into an alias, right? So you can essentially define your own git commands, which you could... In a way, it's a little bit weird because you could just do bash aliases or something. But, um, you know, you can... So instead of log, I use something called LG uh, without the O, and it gives me a nice colored listing of, uh, of file names. And I was going to... There's all collections of git aliases. If you just Google git alias, uh, you can find all kinds of things that people have come up with to, to do it. The one thing I, I get a little bit nervous about these types of things is because what you end up doing is you end up having your own custom Git environment. And then, you know, like when you're at a conference talking about Git commands, you can be spouting off stuff and no one's ever heard of it. Um, so you got to be a little bit careful with that, that you don't get too outside the mainstream. But uh, for sure, you should use, you know, Git alias commands and stuff. Um, Anybody else have like a favorite thing they like to alias and get? CM. Okay, what's CM? Check out master. Check out master. Okay. CM. CM. Get CM. Okay. Yes, you can. If you're tricky, you can like uh, do. Uh, you can you can use all of the um, uh, CVS commands like CO, CI, <laughs> <laughs> like that. But uh, that's probably not recommended. Uh, that'll just confuse you. Um, okay, so a couple other Git tips. Okay, so Git annotate. Okay, I don't know. Again, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. So who's, who's, who has uh, used Git annotate? Okay, so Git annotate is really cool. It gives you, for every line in a file, it uh, shows you the commit ID for the last commit that touched that line. So if you're looking at a file and you're going, what the heck did that get in there? Or who put that in? Uh, you can actually do git annotate, and if you have, if the line is unique enough, can't be like you know an empty line. Oh, it is uh, git annotate is the same as git away. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so vote again. Okay. okay, different show, completely different show of hands. Who, who's heard of git link? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. There's also git phrase. Is there a good, is there a good phrase? That's funny. Okay. So the big thing, of course, is to see you know who's to blame or who's to praise. Uh, and then git bisect. I hope everybody knows how to do git bisect. I don't know if this works on other trees. You know, the kernel developers are a lot are pretty good about trying to make sure that. Um, change sets that go in are bisectable, uh, which means that they don't break stuff in the middle, so you can do these bisects. I actually, just two weeks ago, I had, well, I'll tell you, it's that darn okay, hand of in mainline. <laughs> so anyway, I just used bisect seriously two weeks ago to, to figure out that the panda in 3.6 kernel, the panda board was broken. Uh, well, it wasn't broken, broken, but it had some weird suspend messages pop up. No, they were RCU messages, which are scary. Um, but yeah, I was able to narrow it down. As soon as I found the commit that was causing the problems, I found the LKML discussion based on that. So really, really handy to track down and stuff. And then how to poke through your firewall. So I don't actually have the instructions here for how to poke through your firewall. There are a couple of... Um, but this is something I've made me put online, my own experiences. It turns out, uh, I, so how many people are behind corporate firewalls that are annoyed by having to get access? Okay, so let me tell you, I'll give you the short version. I'll try to put my details up. I actually took some notes because I just solved this for myself. Seriously, like about two months ago, I finally got a whole punch through the firewall. Okay, so the problem is that uh, their firewalls come in at least three flavors. There's uh, SOX firewalls, there's HTTP firewalls, and uh, there's one other flavor out there. Um, but, and you have to kind of know which firewall you're trying to, or which uh, proxy, sorry, proxies come in three flavors. And you try to figure out which type of proxy you're trying to punch through. In my, in my case, it turned out that I had to go through a proxy in Japan uh, that was only accessible from a machine in Japan. 
And so I had to set up an SSH tunnel to a machine in Japan uh, that I could then proxy out through. So now I probably described so much of the Sony's internal security that you can all break in now. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so, but uh, if you stick with it, and you can get, for years we, I had an SSH, um, an SSH uh, tunnel through, that only went to kernel.org. Uh, the, the, and it worked really great until kernel.org went down. <laughs> and taking Android with it, and, the, and Google got disgusted and took their Android stuff somewhere else, and then I couldn't get the Android stuff. And so, but anyway, I finally got that resolved. Um, I'll, put a, I'll put a page on the eLinux wiki about my experiences with uh, getting proxy. Uh, hopefully it'll help someone. I found that the information out there is confusing because it, I didn't find a single source that described you know, the different types of proxies that you have to deal with. Um, okay, and then I, I did an email thing on the eLinux, uh, no, on C-Linux dev mailing list and talked, and a bunch of people said, oh, get rebase. I, I think a lot of people are doing git rebase. Um, and the use case here is when you have to refactor your patches, uh, which I do, I'm kind of a sloppy developer. I'll go super, super fast, write up, get my prototype working, and then, you know, a month or two into the project, it's time to like actually go back and clean stuff up, and then it gets like really painful. Uh, and so what I, I tend to do is I tend to just bundle everything up at the end of the project into a single large commit, and then I've got to refactor it back out. And so git rebase, that's exactly what git rebase is for. Um, minus minus picks up and minus minus auto scroll should probably be on that list. Okay, wait, wait, say that again? Uh, if you're going to do rebasing, you can use fix ups to change your patches very exactly. easily. Okay, if, if minus you, minus fix up? Um, or or git commit. Git commit minus 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 fix up. Oh, git okay. commit minus minus fix up. Is that the same thing as git commit amend? No. No. You give, you give the start <laughs> uh, idea for the commit you want to fix. Oh, you can fix one back in the history? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so okay. then, if you can, then you use git rebase minus i and uh, minus minus all the squad. And it's a automatic to fix up to where it's supposed to go. Oh, wow. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, it's, it's, again. <laughs> <laughs> it's very useful. <laughs> okay, so can you say that? Okay, I'm going to give you the mic. <laughs> okay, say that we'll see what's going on. By using git commit minus minus fix up and the side of the commit you want to fix, uh, it will be committed as usual, but it will have a special uh, first commit line which basically says fix up uh, uh, bang and then the, uh, the message of the original commit. Okay. Then when you use git base minus i minus minus auto squash, it will automatically move that fix up line to where it's supposed to be that is just behind the original comment. Oh, okay. And you can do the same with minus minus squash if you want to use squash rather than fix up. Okay. Okay. So it is my, my tip is a com an alias git fix up that basically does git commit minus minus fix up and another alias which is person that I use R I so the side git from base minus I minus 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 squash. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, so my my problem uh, so I've tried get rebase a couple of times and without fail I've screwed up my patches. <laughs> and I, I don't know I, I don't know how to explain it other than you know I must be an idiot. Uh, but but so my next one is disaster recovery in Git. <laughs> and uh, and this is actually pretty crucial. Reflog has saved me more than once. Okay, it turns out that besides the commit history, there's this whole other completely shadow thing going on where Git records the, the crazy stuff you've done, any commands that have altered the, the tree. And you can go look at that with git ref log. And, and this happens, I have to do this all the time. And I, I think I'm doing git wrong or something. Uh, but uh, but even, if, even if you've like reset your tree, it's still in there. That's the beauty of Git. There's a black box, there's a bag in there, and if you can just get the top of the tree commit ID, you can pull your stuff back out again and get back to a state where you can you know, resume damaging the tree. Um, <laughs> so Git ref log. Anybody else have? Well, it could be a bit more proactive and separately 
temporary problems before you knew they were based. Well, yes. <laughs> well, I did do that. So it shows you how bad I am. Or <laughs> copying the whole thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the easiest way to get back to where Yeah, it is. Uh, so yeah, you can do branches, temporary branches. Uh, also, um, sometimes I'll do a stash, but then I'm never sure because then I've got like I've got more stuff to keep track of, <laughs> right? For the stash. Uh, any other Git disaster recovery tips? You can put it, uh, I use a branch log. I uh, pipe it through all the just print on the wall, and you get all the SHA ones. Pipe that into Git and you get a visual representation of all the commits you've lost. Oh, okay. Which so is quite nice, just to visualize the stuff you've lost. So you <laughs> <laughs> I assume you cut the shards off. And yeah, yeah. So just use all uh, print all one and then pipe that to keep Okay. Or set, yeah. Any Unix tool you like. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it on Elix. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm a set, a set cut guy kind of. But, Thank you know. Other people. <laughs> Uh, in Quilt. 
The other thing that, uh, that we have, because we're um, quilt based, uh, we can, we have a way to remove all of the changes to our kernel and verify that there's nothing that crept into the tree that is not part of our managed change sets. And so we do a very common thing we do before we do a commit is we have a pre-commit script, or at least I do, that does a quilt pop dash all, and we actually do then what is a base diff. We, we diff uh, the, our kernel against a stock kernel.org kernel and make sure that there's no changes in there that are not, uh, have not been captured. If, if we get output from base diff, we know that uh, some change is in our tree that, that is not from one of our quilt patches. Then we push them all back up, and then because Quilt does not manage files and permissions, we have to fix up the file permissions. But that is a, that is a, if you're using a Quilt-based flow, and actually a lot of trees are, I don't know if you've noticed, the stable trees are using Quilt. Um, I think most of the distros, the desktop distros are using Quilt as well. Um, but because I'm so bad with, oh, so go ahead. I was just saying, you can use, um, you know, I can't remember the exact word, is it Quilt apply or? Yeah, there's a quilt of, I, I just heard about that like a couple months ago. Yeah, so. that's quite well. Yeah. And you can find a load of other stuff, and if you've got like a um, not get format patch, patches, yeah. then uh, yeah, you can just sort of specify the author and things and all sorts of stuff. It, uh, the PTX is, it uses it. They use quilt apply or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so and then also because I was, these were, so some of this stuff kind of predates the modern era. Uh, <laughs> so I actually wrote my own tools for splitting and managing patches. I have something called diff info, which is a little bit different than diff stat. Um, it allows you to, to grep inside patches and extract hunks based on regular expression matches or um, on the path to C module. Um, and then on top of that, a split patch. So I can actually, pretty quickly, I had my own tools for, custom tools for splitting up patches. And I feel more comfortable. And then if I, if push comes to shove, I just go edit the patch. And uh, I've actually gotten pretty good at that. So if I would, it, it sounds like if, uh, if I would just get less bad at, uh, at doing git rebase, I could uh, get, dispense with these tools. But does anybody else have any other patch management tips? I don't know if I have any other ones. Okay. Anything for Pat? Sounds like filter <laughs> What? Sounds like filter dip. Perhaps you can some of that. You can do filter dip. Filter dip. I'm not familiar with that. How do you, how do you spell that? F I L T R D I F F I L. Those are regex matching on paths. Filter dip. Okay, so what does it do? I'm sorry. It does like regex matching on paths within a dip so you can switch out. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, so very similar to what this does. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, filter. Is that part of a, there was a, is that part of a tool seat set? It's called patch utils. Patch utils, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've heard of that before. Yeah. Yeah, the one thing, I think in patch utils, there was actually a command that allowed you to do a diff between two patches. Uh, which is uh, kind of magic. Uh, um, anything else on patch management? Okay, well, let's move right along to searching and finding. Okay, so everybody has a problem. I, uh, I'm old school, I use grep and find uh, and xargs. Um, so I have built a whole bunch of custom scripts to search you know, various bodies of either code or data or whatever. Um, and so I can search. Uh, there's one I use, you'd be surprised how often I use something called conf grep. Uh, it, it, yeah, that one in the middle there. Um, and basically, all it does is it tells me what the status is. So I, I tend to build with my uh, build output from the kernel in a separate directory. I always set kbuild output. So I don't like to have generated files inside my source tree. Um, and, and so that usually means it's up over in another directory, and not only that, but it's dependent on the target I'm, I'm writing for. So I'll have a single uh, kernel source tree with a cable, kbuild output directory set, um, and I'll have, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 di directories for different targets. Um, and so it gets really obnoxious to grep over in that other directory. 
And so I've written a bunch of things, but, but CompGrep is one of my favorites. You, so you give it the lowercase uh, search string, and it goes over and looks at the appropriate doc config and tells me what the status of those uh, configuration variables are, because it's usually different for different boards. Um, so, but there's nothing like super magical here. I mean, these are all just really like one-liner, two-liner, uh, fine wrappers. So, is it, what do other people use for searching and stuff? We um, had a really good tool to put in our um, office recently called Open Grok. Um, Open Grok. Open Grok. Open Grok. And it's, I, I can't rate it enough. Because you find yourself, especially in our system, we've got so many different modules, uh, this thing just um, analyzes all of them. And you can just, it's almost like a Google search for your entire source tree. Does it create like an index? Or is it yeah, faster it's all fancy it? indexing the links off. Okay. It's so, like LXR, but for, you can host it internally on your own VM or whatever. So you said it's like LXR, so I'm sorry, what's LXR? <laughs> Put LXR up there! Okay. I would, but I'd have to show you what operates this room. I think it's based on that LXR because of the code. It's a web index, so... Android, you might like Android extra. Android extra? So is this is this Open Grok? Is it an open source tool? The Open Grok's, uh, I think, it's part of is it like apps gettable or? Yeah, it might. It, it's more of a like if you've got a team of people working on a, on everything, then it, it's really valuable. Okay. Um, it, it might take a half man day or man day to. It's a code indexer. Okay. A code indexer. That's really good. See, so I'm, the other thing is I have never mastered the art of C tags, and I, you know. I but with this, you don't need to. Okay. Cisco? Okay. Okay, so one of the tools that you notice that I've got up here is called ARM CGREP, which is by this is my lazy man's way of searching only the ARM tree and not the other architecture. <laughs> <laughs> so you can you can work out whatever you know the magic find the things I'm doing to do that. But uh, the, so a lot of things I worry about like C tags and C scope. Do that are they aware of your build settings? So they will omit junk that is not going to be in your build. C scope, yeah. C scope, yeah. Yeah. On C scope, you can say um, which um, architecture you're building on. And okay. Okay, that's good. Let's check that out. See? I could stop now and go home, please. <laughs> okay, uh, there was another tool that uh, Todd Fisher told me about online, Find S, which is basically very, very similar, except it's using the dash exec uh, fgrep. Uh, and there's a, I'm going to put this, uh, uh, this presentation will be available online, so you don't have to jot down these URLs. Um, okay, kernel debugging. Okay, so <laughs> again, okay, so I, I started developing on the Linux kernel in 1993, and uh, back then all we had was print cake. And uh, luckily I've never had to move on. <laughs> so I'm still doing print cake debugging in the kernel. And one of the things that, I, and this is something I read about, maybe you guys all know this, but one of the things I read about in, I think it was Robert Love's book on the kernel, is uh, a really super easy way to trigger a print K is just to put it in the sync path. And then, so I, there's in fs uh, sync.c, it used to be called uh, sys underscore sync, but now they macroized all the, all the system calls. So, um, you just go to there, and you just put your print case right there. So you know you collect your data somewhere, put some sprinkle some variables throughout the code, and then you put a couple of print case in there. And then it turns out that really nothing calls sync except the user command sync. And so uh, you can, when you want to see the results, you want to see your variables, the instrumentation that you've stuck in. You just type sync, and they pop up on your console, and it's uh, everything's happy and good. It's super, super simple, but it's really easy. It's like way easier than building a proc file or a debug FS file or whatever. Um, what? 
Well, P uh, it depends on what, you can use whatever macro you want for the actual print case. So you can make them PRD loadable or whatever. Um, but it's good for user space triggered print case. Okay, so for what it's worth. And then QAMU, I, recently I started using QAMU. Uh, I don't know, and that's nice because you can, it's almost like a JTAG except with the wrong hardware. Uh, <laughs> uh, if, I don't know, does anybody have? If you need something more simple, you can even use use more Linux and um, develop your virtual hardware, which you then try, uh, write a driver for. Well, so, so use remote Linux. So it turns out that what I'm doing most often is um, strange and unnatural things to the ARM processor. Uh, so does that, there is, is there an ARM user mode Linux or? Not that I'm aware of. So I'm not on the x86 very much right now. So, um, but uh, the other thing, but so user mode Linux, that's good. Uh, QEMU is pretty handy, although it takes a little, it's kind of a little bit of a pain to set up. And then, I don't know how many times I've, I, I've known this and then forgotten it. You know, I've spent like a couple hours trying to figure out why my print keys aren't coming up. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's right, because I didn't turn on early debugging. Um, on R, make sure you turn on config debug LL and config early print K. And uh, if that fails you, then your bug is earlier than when the console is initialized. But you still can get at the data. So if you're using U-boot or some other bootloader that allows you to dump memory, uh, you can reset the board. And uh, if you go look in the system.map file, and then you have to figure out manually, you have to do the uh, arithmetic to find out where it actually sits in, in RAM, you can just, you can dump memory, and it's pretty easy to find the, uh, pretty easy to find the print K buffer, uh, because it's the only portion of memory that's full of ASCII text. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, I've used that several times on board bring up. Uh, again, you know, no JTAG for me. I'm a print K guy all the way. Uh, so anyway, any other tips for print? Well, this is this should be called print K debugging. But, uh, any other tips for kernel debugging? I don't know if I have any more. Uh, yeah, I don't have any. So what do people do to kernel debug? How many? Okay, just a just kind of a fun survey. How many people are using JTAG? Okay, lucky guys. <laughs> Uh, how about, how many? Print K was okay until you start with SMP and then. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a problem. Print K, depending on what you're debugging, Print K can be a real bear with the SMP. Um, okay, so how many people are doing Print K debugging like me? Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, there you go. Well, that's everybody's backup, right? <laughs> okay, what are the other, uh, who's using like an emulator or a simulator? A <laughs> people. I have, I don't use it a whole lot. Um, what are the what are the other ways? KGDB. Oh, KGDB. Yeah, who's using KGDB? Oh, only one person in the back of this. I've done it, but it. I don't know. It's like a hassle to set up. Yeah. And uh, if well, yeah. Okay. I use one thing. Okay. Um, you have this last group. This last uh, email. Oh, that's the kernel memory. You just dump that to a file, and you can use UEB. Uh, oh. VM, VM Linux, space, I think you have dump it, and you can go through all the variables. That's very, very nice. Really? You can do KGB on a KMM dump? Yeah. Wow. Okay, you can write that down. <laughs> it's just a straight cat, or? Yeah, normal cat. I was using KDDB and then I moved to this one. So is this GDB, then do you have to specify like an offset to the memory or? Uh, GDB? Yeah. EMD? Yeah. And then they dump. So it treats the memory from address zero as the core file for the kernel? Okay. But of course you can continue. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's a useful tool when working with Android, the Android RAM console. Oh, RAM console. Yeah, I didn't mention that. RAM console is really handy. And in fact, there, I think, I think, um, 
people have been working on integrating the RAM console stuff from Android with the P Store stuff, and I don't know what status it is, but we really should be, I mean, even on non-Android systems, we shouldn't be able to get to the thing where you can look at the messages from the last kernel boot. I mean, gosh, this is what, the 21st century? <laughs> it's not that hard to buffer stuff between from one kernel boot to the next. Um, so yeah, so RAM console, and uh, we could probably do a whole thing on that. Okay, so the only thing I have to say about testing, I want to I make sure we, I leave some time, because there are a couple other people wanted to talk about stuff. <laughs> what? LEDs. Yeah. LEDs, yes. Okay. <laughs> I've done more to bring up with one LED. <laughs> and, 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 you know, timing the number of flashes. Uh, yes. Got to hear and ask me. <laughs> or scope. Yeah, or, or scope. So I have the only thing I have to say here, I don't do a whole lot of kind of official testing. I do have some automated tools, but um, I have something called tbtorture.shell for stress testing. And I actually got this, it was based on uh, a command called uh, do hell by Ingo Molnar. And it's just a command that, was, that starts off a whole bunch of uh, different processes doing DDs and finds and and uh, pings, and so it does network traffic, file system traffic, and it does memory you know, utilization. Uh, and so I just use this for stress testing. Uh, most of the thing I'm doing to the kernel, I, I'm just basically trying to see if I've made it so the kernel falls over. Um, but this is only like a 20 line shell script, and uh, I don't know, what do other people use for, for testing? I guess it depends on what you're testing, but uh, any comments or? Ellen Bench. Ellen Bench? Yeah, it's very good to find uh, I don't know, bugs. <laughs> does does Elmbench find like you know I guess robustness regressions where does it actually knock the kernel over if something's gone wrong? Well, at least I've got to knock the kernel. Well, that's a good skill to have. <laughs> okay, um, what about um, I know that the real time guys are doing cyclic test, right? So if you're doing real time stuff. Uh, cyclic test is kind of a preferred tool. Um, what about LTP? Are there people that are, are we we run LTP inside Sony, uh, but I don't I don't know if it ever really finds that much. I mean, every once in a while you get regressions, but does it find stuff, Frank? Yeah. What do we do about it? <laughs> oh, that's very lightning. <laughs> is anybody else running LTP? It's by a couple people. Okay. I've done it in the past. What? Okay. Okay. Board handling. So I'm going to talk a little bit just about board handling. So I don't know what your shop does. Okay. Uh, let me describe my situation at Sony. So I work with a distro team inside Sony, and so we actually support several different product teams, and we have uh, several different uh, target boards that we're working on at any one time. And so uh, we have, we, in order to just keep ourselves from going insane, we have to provide a consistent setup. And it's consistent across boards at the same time, it's also consistent over time. So we have actually abstracted all of the, um, the, the access to the board. Well, I'll talk about that on the next slide. So, but we find it very useful to do a very consistent board setup. So usually, what we do, and we have to make exceptions sometimes, but usually we make sure we have a serial connection, a network connection, power connection, and sometimes USB. Uh, my personal favorite on the power connection is something called digital power logger. Uh, it's just, it's a rack mounted, except we don't have a rack, it's just on my desk. Uh, it's, uh, actually it's, under my de it's, a, it's a rack sized thing with power plugs that you can access with a web browser. And, and then I use wget just to toggle the power things on and off. And so uh, basically I get command line control of all my power stuff. And I've, I've tried all kinds of stuff before. I used to have uh, these little, uh, what were they, parallel port dongles mm -hmm. that would control relays that would turn power on and off. 
Okay, so there's, a, there's innumerable ways to do this, but the basic idea is that you really want to get yourself to a point where you can do this from the command line. Anything you control from the command line, you, you, then you can put a fancy interface on it if you want, or uh, put, I, I've done stuff where I've, we've done web servers with you know, GUIs or whatever, uh, but the power control is really key there. Um, and uh, usually, what we try to do that makes it a lot easier if you're TFTP booting the kernel. This is, I think almost everybody's doing this nowadays. Uh, well, except we're not on a Panda board because, <laughs> anyway. Uh, but then also an NFS root file system. And so then all your, stu all your stuff can be done on host, right? So you can manipulate the kernel, you can recompile the kernel, you can change the file system, and it's all just transparent. It comes up automatically the next time you. Uh, Next time you reboot. We have um, a good tip for NFS root file system if you want to install a bridge because then you are disconnecting your Ethernet line. I'm sorry, say that again? If you root FS over NFS and you install a software bridge, uh, you sometimes disconnect your board from the NFS server. Mm -hmm. Right. And how to overcome this? Well, okay, so. I don't know, it used to be the case that NFS is stateless, right? So I've had cases where I've switched hosts <laughs> and, uh, and brought the NFS back up and it still works. Uh, uh, but I don't know, I don't know the answer to that question. So does anybody know the answer to the question, what happened? What do you do if you're going over a bridge and uh, you drop the NFS connection? You don't use NFS. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, something interesting I heard about NFS, I think that I have it on one of the later slides, is um, I guess PTX Dist has a user space NFS that does not require uh, root privileges to set up. Uh, let me see if I've got that here. I don't know. So, so if, you, if you, you're in a situation where you don't have uh, root access to your machine, I guess that's an option for you. Um, okay, so we do, do have to do other weird things like SD cards, and there's a, a new product that they've got out. David Anders was showing me. Um, it's not a product, I think it's a little board that he built that allows you to share the SD card lines so you can flip them between the target and the host. And so that would, that's handy, isn't it? <laughs> so that way you can program the SD card and then, again, from the command line, flip it so it's back over to the target, access it, and then just reboot your target. Where can I get you get? <laughs> I've talked to David Anders. Okay, so there's going to be a rush on David Anders. He's uh, at the Panther board. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a box from a company called uh, HW Group, uh, back to the digital power logger, uh, which is a, a relay and also a serial port over Ethernet. Which oh, okay. Oh, over Ethernet. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, and it's got Linux drivers for the... Well, no, you don't need it. So I just did an echo something, something just pipe it to Netcat to, to power it on. Okay, what was the company name again? HW-Group. HW-Group. And that is a uh, power... Well, relay. Relay. So whatever you want. Relay, relay and serial. serial port. And, yeah. Over Ethernet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's actually uh, uh, well, it's it can be built yourself kit from Bellman that's uh, eight relay car that's uh, accessible through serial port. It's really cheap, uh, like thirty euros or something. Uh, we we used it quite a lot. Uh, it just takes the serial port input, but it can even take GPIOs in or a signal in, so you can turn it on and off through okay. serial or GPIOs. Okay. And it's uh, three colors, you can switch it between two, okay. uh, which uh, is very helpful if you have a, uh, a header that has uh, on and off positions on the board. Right. Okay. So, yeah. For switchable power, um, I can also recommend um, use two controllable um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've actually done that before too. So you have a USB thing <coughs> where, yeah, there's like a, there's a driver you can depower the USB and then it takes the the power supply down. Yeah. 
Yeah. But you're working for Sony, just buy a remote power and that's it, no? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so then, so now that we've got all our hardware kind of in the same consistent setup, we also want to access it from the command line in a very consistent form. And so we actually have a tool inside tar uh, Sony called TTC. Um, it used to be just target control, but it turns out there's some other Linux command called TC. Um, but it abstracts the difference between boards. So I never actually access the boards directly using commands. I mean, we have these subcommands that are like power switch this or uh, <coughs> minicom that. Um, but what we do is uh, we just have everything runs through TTC, and so we can access the board. Everything is scriptable. It's basically a thin wrapper over just shell script fragments. Um, and it's remotable. So I can, I, I do this all the time when I'm traveling. If I can get SSH back to my desk, um, I can do everything on the boards in our board farm, uh, including compiling kernels, you know, building, uh, and the things that it abstracts are, you know, what tool chain is used on this board, what's the name of the kernel image, where, what's the architecture, what def config to use, uh, all the paths, <coughs> how, how do you build a kernel for this, how do you install the, the kernel on this, and, and some of the boards are pretty funky, like on the Panda board I had to do a whole kind of SD card switching thing. Uh, to, to set that one up. Um, but also things like just console access. So some of our boards uh, in development are using SSH, but I think most people are using SSH. But we have a couple older ones that uh, the only network console we have on them is Telnet. And so instead of trying to remember that for every board, we just have these wrappers over everything. And then things like file system access. Um, and so, like, when I get... <coughs> now I've, the nice thing about this is it can also be layered on top of something else. So like if I'm using an Android board, most of this stuff just maps down to ADD commands, uh, right? Because that's what Android has for accessing target stuff. Um, but uh, there's another item that came up, which is finding the TTY USB for a board. Um, and this I got from someone, a guy had written a script called LSUART that showed him which USB devices were, were on which ports. Um, so, I actually, uh, if you are interested in this LSUR uh, command, uh, let me know and I'll get a hold of Todd or you can just follow the thing on the email list. Um, so that's pretty handy because sometimes we have, uh, in our, uh, we have, we do almost everything through US, serial to USB and uh, in our lab, I don't know how many, we have, I don't know, at least 10. Uh, USB connections over TTY, and, and they, when you upgrade things, sometimes they change numbers. Um, this is also kind of similar to that. You can also use by ID. What? Yeah, you use dev serial by ID, and then you connect always to the unique ID of the serial converter. Yeah, the ID from serial what? And then by dash ID. What's serial by ID? Okay. So if you move it to a different port, it still gets the same name. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Also, instead of using Minicom, I use a screen. Screen? Yeah, use a screen. screen also. Also. Okay, so yeah, I heard that there are other people using things besides the canonical Minicom. So, how many people are using Minicom? Okay, how many people are using Screen? How many people are using Pico? What, what is it called? Picocom? Picocom. Oh, a couple. Uh, my understanding is that the PicoCom users are the most enlightened. But <laughs> so anyway, that's that's what someone who was using PicoCom told me. Uh, so Sir to net um, Christoph, Jean Christoph uh, told me about this one, and I don't know that much about it. I think it's for dealing with old uh, multi-port serial boards. Uh, if you do that, then this we're doing everything through USB to uh, serial to USB. So. We don't really have to map much more. Okay, and then this is the thing. Uh, PTX dist and, and bare box. Uh, you can load the kernel via NFS. Um, and I'm not sure how they're doing that, because I don't... Anyway, it, I'm not sure if that's a typo or not. But uh, it does not require root images on host. So if you want to set up uh, an NFS or a network you know, boot system for your machine, and you don't have root access to your thing, then you can do that. Um, you can copy images of the serial line. We've done that before. Um, okay, then I have a little bit about uh, personal productivity. Before we go into that, are there any other um, 
board management type things? What do, how do people manage your boards? What do you guys do when you get a board? You break it out, sit it on your desk, connect the cable? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, who, here, who here works with more than uh, four architectures at a time? No. <laughs> Three? <laughs> it's not true anymore. It's not true anymore. We, I used to. I used to work with a lot of different architectures. How about how many? How many are dealing with more than three boards at a time, though? Yeah, that's a lot. And do they all have U-boot or what's the bootloaders of choice these days? No kernel. What? Little kernel. Little kernel? Is that like a K-exec thing or? No. Oh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I know. Okay. Red boot was used on a lot of boards. There's all kinds of different boot. Bear box. We mainly use a network JTAG, and that's also got serial connections, so you can yeah. essentially tell that to the JTAG. To Wait, the okay. Oh, you're 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 booting directly through JTAG? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. it's like make run. It compiles and then just loads. It just puts it on the in the board. Like, <laughs> okay, okay. I gotta write that down. <laughs> well, yeah, and there is. If you're doing, everybody knows about uh, fast boot, right? On uh, if you're doing Android stuff, the, you, one of the fast boot command line options is to shove the thing over the USB port to the directly into RAM. So. That one's pretty handy. Um, let's see here. Okay, so there was someone else who approached me that said they had a couple slides. Who was it? Are they here? No one's going to pass up. Okay. I wanted to give them a chance real quick. Oops. Oh, that's not good. Um, yeah, it wasn't working anymore. Uh, okay, so personal productivity. Okay, this is completely unrelated to uh, Embedded Linux, actually. Um, so I, I don't, and this is kind of just, I have a ton of stuff I'm working on, and I just have a hard time keeping track. You know, different people have day planners or whatever, but I have, I keep everything in a text file that I, called todo.txt. <laughs> so, uh, and I, but I have a little label on uh, what the stuff I'm going to work on today, and I usually have to migrate tasks from day to day because I don't finish everything. You know, I usually put up like ten items. You know, I'm gonna get done today, and I, you know, and then two of them get checked off. Uh, and then I have to move the next eight to the, the following day. Uh, so I have a little today script that tells me from that to do it. Just a, it's just like an awk or a, it's actually a said script, but anyway, um, <coughs> that just shows me what I'm working on. And uh, and and then, and then the other thing that I find uh, because I'm working on different several different projects. So at the moment. I'm working on uh, something having to do with uh, small stacks on ARM. I'm working on uh, uh, something having to do with uh, whole system optimization to reduce the kernel and system image size. And I also have way, way, way in the background, I'm doing some crash handler stuff for, uh, for the TV group. Anyway, um, but my problem is when I switch from one task to another, you just lose all your context. You know, if you don't get back to a task for a couple of weeks, it's, you're, just, you're just dead if you have if you've not recorded what you've been doing. And so, I this is just again, this is a very simple uh, tip that I do. I put notes files everywhere. And so, at the top level directory of each of my kind of major work directories, I have a notes file. And I bet, essentially, I, I like mentally, I like to think of it as like a context switch. So, when I'm doing a context switch out of this is the hardest part. Uh, when I'm doing context switch out, I got to remember to dump everything I'm thinking of, all the kind of the dangling research items or the, the to do list for that item into a notes file before I do a context switch. Otherwise, when I come back to it a week later, I, I'm just dead. You know, you got to restart from scratch. You got to go grab in the files like, what was going on here again? Uh, that's just something I do. Um, and then I keep a ton of stuff in Git branches. Uh, almost every single one of those projects, well, every project that I'm working on, I'll probably have 10 to 15 branches going. Um, and, and I have to put in my notes file which branch I was working on <laughs> and what's in the different branches. So I keep lots of notes uh, going. Because uh, I don't like to, well, I like to keep my debug stuff separate from, from the other thing. Um, <coughs> That's just personal productivity. Anybody else have any comments on kind of what they do, how they manage their? 
Uh, I usually use this create a screen session for each project at the moment. Uh, they stay active for weeks or months at a time. You can keep that shit doing it. Okay. So I actually, I actually will keep, you know, I have multiple sessions going and uh, I have, I, you know, like I'll actually have all the files checked out and I'll even leave editors running uh, for like a week at a time when I'm not in it. And uh, it bit me really bad one time because I hadn't written in the notes file. I thought, well, it's all just sitting in there in the editor right on the line that needs to be edited. And then my machine froze and I lost all my sessions. It was really brutal. <laughs> But uh, but so when you say screen session, are you talking about? I'm not sure what you're exactly saying. Just you leave a bunch of open terminal windows or the screen the, 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 the tool, screen the tool screen the tool screen. You just start a session with uh, multiple uh, yeah, windows and it's done. You, you detach it if you go home and you start it. Uh, no. Okay. It will stay in the background. Basically, it's the background. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so screen cool. session. You left the window open. Any, anything Rain. else people are doing? Yeah. The cool thing about screen is that uh, another, another, another person can log, off. log in with SSH to your machine, and you both can work on the same screen, like you're showing something. And then okay. But for my task, I'm usually using, using Exchange. I'm using the Exchange flags. So I have like, a, like a four different colors, one for each project that I'm working on. And just all that my task can, comes from mail. So just putting flags and then I can see it on my phone or on the web. Okay. So it's nice. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, so mailing lists. So what mailing lists are you on? I mean, everybody's kind of on probably the obvious ones. I don't know. I'm on LKML, but let's face it, I don't read it that way. Um, I basically shove it into a folder and then when I hear about an interesting discussion, I go by and look in the folder and see what I missed. It's usually too late to comment by that time. But uh, I hang out on Linux Arm. Yocto Develop, been doing some Yocto stuff lately. Uh, C Linux Dev. So are there any other kind of general embedded Linux <coughs> mailing lists? Oh yeah, Linux Embedded. We had this big thing a couple years ago to make Linux Embedded a nice kernel developer mailing list for all the embedded Linux engineers. I don't know the last time I saw a message go by on it. Uh, so it's kind of, it seems like it's dead. So. If you want to hang out and just kind of watch traffic go by about embedded Linux, I recommend CE Linux Dev. It's not got the greatest name, but it is. Uh, it, there are some interesting discussions on there every once in a while. This type of thing. Any other mailing lists that people recommend? News sites, LWN.net, obviously, and then Thomas Pedazzoni just wrote about. Uh, he's got a new embedded uh, Linux news feed that he's doing. So. Uh, Linux RT users is creating Which one? Linux RT users. Linux RT our, users? Yeah, for the RT patch. Okay. Yeah, there obviously there's a there's a lot of ones for specific subsystems, right? But there's Okay. Now, events. So what event does everyone go to? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important. Uh, I used to, this is just kind of advice, I, I used to get really worried about missing sessions, and I should not say this because I'm one of the organizers of this conference, and I don't want to, you to not go to sessions. Uh, but really, the hallway tracks are what's really important. Um, and uh, not that you don't get good information. I saw some great presentations today. You know, I'm going to go bang on F2FS and and uh, I got some ideas from other sessions to, to stuff to go look at. But if you're, if you're uh, spending all your time in session and you're not actually out in the hallways talking to your peers, your embedded Linux peers, you're kind of missing out. Uh, and so that's really important to make sure that you're talking to people. And don't be afraid to approach uh, people who are kind of like the maintainers or the luminaries and uh, ask them uh, their opinion about something. Uh, some of the best advice I've gotten has been uh, a 30 second conversation on a bus uh, to the social event. I got, I got something in San Diego, saved me like two weeks worth of effort just because I was willing to talk to a guy and uh, you know, I didn't, think, I didn't think this guy was going to know anything about my problem and he didn't, but he still gave me advice that was very useful. <laughs> Um, so the conferences I attend, uh, ELC and ELC Europe, 
Uh, LinuxCon US, uh, I go to, there's not a whole lot of embedded, but there's kind of getting more and more. Um, LinuxCon Japan, uh, LinuxCon Europe I attend, uh, because it's co-located with this one. Uh, uh, but what do other people go to? Um, I know Plumber seems to be the new OLS. Uh, is anybody, who goes to Plumber's? Anybody here go to Plumber's? Oh, there's not very many, okay. So, well, I don't want to diss on a conference, but, <laughs> but other regional events, are there other things? Like, I did, I did not know that uh, France apparently has an embedded Linux some kind of event. Uh, I just heard about that a couple weeks ago. And I, uh, Japan has these things called Japan Jamborees that are conducted in uh, Japanese mostly, but there are some English talks, and I attend those by Skype. Uh, so are there other events that, uh, like FOSDEM, who goes to... You guys say positive. So, one of the things I worry about is we miss the content from those. That you know they're regional, and so there's a certain number of people who get to them. But uh, I feel like I've missed them. I don't know. Do they take videos at Boston? Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. What else do people attend? Are there other conferences people attend, or well, maybe I get out more than you guys? <laughs> oh, Lenaro, yeah, 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 Connect. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. Yeah, and they're streaming stuff now. So you don't have to you know, pay to go to Copenhagen. Lenaro Connect was just last week in Copenhagen, but they streamed a bunch of their sessions. So if you're interested in one of the work group meetings that they're doing there, it's all open and streamed. So that's really good. Are they still anywhere? What? I think, they're, I think they're all stored on YouTube, yeah. I think they use Google Hangouts. Yeah. So it ends up just landing in YouTube. So that's actually good. Um, okay. <laughs> Anything else? Anything else wanna, people want to give in terms of a tip or a trick? Okay, well, I hope this session has been useful. Hopefully you've learned at least one new thing that you can go back and try out. And uh, if so, I hope that uh, this was time well spent for you. So thanks.